I invite you to stand. Receive the joy of your glory, giving thanks to God who has called you into the heavenly kingdom. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your um, today is not only the second Sunday of Easter, today is Divine Mercy Sunday, and it's been instituted, I believe it was Pope St. John Paul II who instituted Divine Mercy Sunday. Um, we're we'll hear more about, we have the image in front of the altar right now of Divine Mercy, and we recognize that um, in so many ways, the whole message of the gospel is the message of Divine Mercy, the message that uh, because of our sins, we deserve death, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we have access to life, we have access to forgiveness, we have access to mercy. And so we, at the beginning of every Mass, again, this is the heart of the Gospel, at the beginning of every Mass, we have the opportunity to either reject that, to, to, to dismiss it. We have the opportunity, actually, even to ignore our sins and be stuck in them. Or we have the opportunity to, with God's grace, face our sins, face our brokenness, face our need, and call upon Him in His mercy. So in this moment, I invite us all to make that choice, to call upon, to face our need, and to call upon the Lord who fills that need. Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You live to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. God of everlasting mercy, who in the very recurrence of the Paschal Feast kindle the faith of the people you have made your own, increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed, that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font they have been washed, by whose spirit they have been reborn, by whose blood they have been redeemed. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's Word. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The community of believers was one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they had everything in common. With a great power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great favor was accorded them all. There was no needy person among them, for those who owned property or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sale, and put them at the feet of the apostles, and they were distributed to each according to need. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is everlasting. Give, Give thanks, thanks to the Lord, for he is good. good. His, His love is everlasting. everlasting. Let the house of Israel say, Have mercy. His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His mercy endures forever. Give, Give thanks, thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is everlasting. I was hard-pressed and was falling, 
but the Lord helped me. My strength and my courage is the Lord, and he has been my savior. The joyful shout of victory in the tents of the just. Give Give thanks thanks to to the the Lord, Lord, for he is good. His His love is everlasting. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. Let this, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love is everlasting. A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is begotten by God. And everyone who loves the Father loves also the the one begotten by him. In this way, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whoever is begotten by God conquers the world. And the victory that conquers the world is our faith. Who indeed is the victor over this world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This, This is the one who came through the water and blood Jesus Christ, not by water alone, but by water and blood. The Spirit is the one that testifies, and the Spirit is truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. And bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, you have a seat. So there's something, uh, I I got to go home over over Easter break, just, I mean, for like 24 hours, 23 hours, something like this. Um, And one of the things you just find when you're around kids is, is how... How interested, especially when they're hunting for Easter eggs, how, um, how fair is a really big deal. Like just how everything has to be fair as far as like when it comes to who found their Easter egg basket first, how many people, uh, who found as many eggs first. Sometimes my parents will do this thing where they put like some money in, in a plastic Easter egg and you have to find that. Like what's fair? Like in, in the whole idea is, especially if you've got a bunch of kids, you want to be as fair as possible. Because at the end of the day, there's this thing that we all have and it's not bad. It's that thing of like, I want to get what I deserve. And that, I've been reflecting on that notion of, okay, fairness is one thing, but that sense of like, I want to get what I deserve. And I think we all want that in some ways. 
We have, a, we have a sense of what we deserve, and I, I, I want to get that thing I deserve. And I'm thinking about this not just because of Easter, but going back even a couple, more couple weeks is, I, I think I might have mentioned this before, we were on a pilgrimage to Poland, oh, maybe a month or a month and a half ago now. And in one of the places, one of the many places we went to was Auschwitz. And so the death camp, and now, now 20, 25 years ago, I had gone to Dachau in Germany. And I remember that at the time they said, you know, Dachau is different. Dachau is a, con a true concentration camp where Auschwitz, if you ever go there in Poland, Auschwitz was a true death camp. In fact, um, the number of Jews and Polish people and gypsies, Catholics, all these different people who were killed at Auschwitz is something around two and a half million people who were gassed and then incinerated. In fact, not only those people who were gassed and incinerated, as we walked through this place, the guide who was telling us all about the situation there and the living situations was, they said, yeah, some people were immediately, they were just brought to the gas chamber and then executed or shot and then incinerated. But some people, they simply worked and starved to death. Maybe, uh, maybe half a million to a million other people who weren't gassed, they, they, but they were just worked and starved to death. So that the average life expectancy of someone at Auschwitz was three months. It was a true death camp. But even in this death camp, the, the, this, this guide, she showed us a, a, bar, show, a barracks for children. And that was, the whole place was horrifying. The whole place was so dark and difficult to walk through. But this barracks for children, she pointed out how um, each, each bunk, they would sleep up to seven children. And there are three levels of bunks. And she said, you know, you really want it to be on the top bunk. And I was just thinking, why? And she said, because, you know, little kids get diarrhea. Little kids get sick in the middle of the night, throwing up. And that just leaks through the slats and that top bunk through the second bunk to the bottom bunk. And I just remember thinking, like, out of all of the, all, out of all of the atrocities, all the horror that was Auschwitz, like that, that's one that just struck me. Interestingly enough, the man who was in charge of Auschwitz, his name was Rudolf Hess. And Rudolf Hess, um, you know, he was baptized as a Catholic. He was raised as a Catholic. In fact, his, his, his father wanted him to be a priest. And when his dad died, he just, Rudolf, he was being pushed into that, so he just abandoned that and ban abandoned the church and, uh, yeah, went, essentially started working for the Nazi party and became the person who was the commandant of Auschwitz. And I don't know if he was ideologi ideologically driven. I don't know if he like really had a hatred of the Jews and a desire to exterminate them, but he was given a task and he wanted to be very good at his task. And so he was trying to be as efficient as possible, killing, I think, up to, at some point, thousands and thousands a day, trying to find a ma way to maximize the incineration to get rid of all these bodies. After the war, he, <laughs> he even tried to kill himself, fleeing from the authorities, but they stopped him from killing himself and put him on trial. You have to, have to ask the question, okay, what, what did Rudolf Hess, this man who was responsible, if, they, I mean, if anyone was responsible for the three million people, three and a half million people who were murdered at Auschwitz, I mean, imagine, you just pause on that for a second, three and a half million people. We know that one person's death is a tragedy, but three and a half million people. The person responsible, the question is, what did he deserve? You know, they just recently came out with a movie called Zone of Interest. It was about his life, about his family's life. They, 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 on the tour, they showed us the cottage right outside the walls, right outside the, the, uh, the barbed wire fence was this cottage where Rudolf Hess's wife and their five kids lived, and they lived in this separated. I mean, they could probably hear the screams of the prisoners and people who were dying, but they just kind of lived their own life. What did that man deserve? I think we'd all agree that he would deserve justice. You know, because that's a good thing, right? Justice is a real thing. Justice is, justice is a virtue, right? Justice is giving someone what they're owed, like giving someone their due. And we all want justice, and that, again, that's, that's good. In fact, we all want what? We all want the reality that our decisions have consequences, right? That if you're going to choose this, then there's a consequence here. We all, we all like the idea, the truth, that the reality, that our choices should have consequences. In fact, one of the first revelations of God is that God's goodness is that he is just. Part of God's goodness is that he is just in that, that sense of the, he lets us have what we've chosen. That he, part of God's justice is that he gives us what we deserve. Now pause on this for one second because it's important to understand that, that God's justice is not arbitrary. It's also not obvious, and it's not necessarily always immediate. What I mean by that is this. Um, this is very important for us to understand that God's justice is not arbitrary, it's intrinsic. So we all know the difference between arbitrary justice and intrinsic justice. Arbitrary justice is you 
you broke your curfew, and so your parents say, okay, from now on, you're going to um, wash the dishes and rake the leaves. So it's kind of like just assigned a punishment to this infraction that you, that you broke, right? This, this law that you broke, rule that you broke. That's an arbitrary consequence. That's an arbitrary judgment, right? arbitrary justice. Now, intrinsic justice is, um, hey, don't touch that hot stove. You touch the hot stove and your hands burned. So the, the intrinsic justice is the consequence is directly and immediately, intrinsically, you might say, related to the crime, essentially. God's justice is always intrinsic justice. It's never arbitrary justice. And that's very important for us to understand. We, we get what we've chosen. But it's also, God's justice is not always obvious. God's justice is not always immediate. In fact, Psalm 73 says it like this. <laughs> the, psalm, the psalmist is looking at the people who are wicked. And he says, he says, they have no struggles. Their bodies are sound and sleek. He says, they're not troubled like others. They're not afflicted like other men. That's one of the realities that we have to experience. One of the realities we experience is that, okay, yeah, God's justice is intrinsic, it's not arbitrary, but it's also not obvious and it's also not immediate because, why? Because good things happen to bad people and sometimes bad things happen to good people and that, that can lead to a distrust because not only sometimes are the consequences slow in coming for those who do wrong, but also we can be tempted to think sometimes, right? We know that God's justice, that there's consequences to our choices that all bad things that come our way are the result of our sins. Sometimes we think that. I remember hearing the story recently of a young woman um, when, she was, when she was 15, her name's Maureen. When she was 15, Maureen had this disease called lymphedema. And her faith was already weak as a 15-year-old. And this diagnosis made her faith even weaker. At one point, she actually, in her teens, had to have her, one of her legs amputated. And she said, and again, this is the wound that we all experience. She said that I thought I was being punished for something I had done or for something that I would possibly do in the future. And how many times is that us? How many times when something bad is happening to us, we think, okay, this is, this is some kind of punishment that I've done or this is, has to do with something I might do in the future. We can think like this because out of all of our wounds, all the wounds that we have in our lives, the wound of distrust is probably the most powerful. In fact, it goes all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis 1 and 2, God makes us in right relationship with him. But then in Genesis chapter 3, when we choose evil, when we choose sin, something happens to us. Not only, obviously, do we have a break in our relationship with God and with each other and with ourselves, but the Catechism says it like this. It says, with our parents, our first parents' first sin, trust died. Trust in God died in the human heart. That out of, all the, out of all the wounds that we have, the wound of distrust is probably the most powerful. But also, realize the gospel is this. The gospel of, is God coming to heal that wound. Now, there are many wounds that Jesus didn't heal, and there are many wounds that God doesn't heal. But the wound he wants to always heal is this wound of distrust. I mean, to realize that the whole story of the gospel is to heal this wound. The incarnation, right? Christmas. God becomes one of us. Why? For you. To, to win your trust. That, that God enters into poverty voluntarily. Why? For you, to win your trust. God, God allows himself to be rejected for you, to win your trust. He allows himself to be betrayed for you and for me, to win our trust. Last week, we commemorated the passion, the cross. Why did Jesus do that? He did it for you, to win your trust. Why did he rise from the dead? To heal this wound of distrust. And even today's gospel, this is so amazing, what happens? Jesus, in the resurrection, he comes to the disciples and he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Now, this is the most amazing thing. Jesus gives the power to forgive sins to his apostles. That what Jesus made possible on Calvary, right? The forgiveness of our sins is made actual by the Holy Spirit through the church. Say that again. What Jesus made possible on Calvary, that mercy is now possible, the Holy Spirit makes actual through the church, through the work of the church. Why? For you, to heal that wound of distrust. And that's why this actual feast, the second Sunday after Easter, is called Divine Mercy Sunday. Why? Because we need to do what St. Faustina said Jesus told her. So, so in the 1930s, there was, in Poland, there was this young nun. And we realized that darkness had come over our world. Now, darkness is always present. We recognize that the darkness of the 20th century is some of the deepest darkness that has ever existed on the planet. And so here's Jesus who appears to this young nun in Poland, Sister Faustina Kowalska. And one of the things he said is he said, I need you to do this. I need you to proclaim that mercy is the greatest attribute of God. 
that mercy is God's greatest attribute. Now think about this for a second. What is God? God is love. But mercy is the highest form of love. Mercy is the greatest form of love. Why? Because what is mercy? Mercy is the love of God that we need the most. But it's also the love of God that we deserve the least. That, that, that mercy is hope of the, the hope of the hopeless. Mercy is the confidence of the guilty. Mercy, mercy, in fact, you say it like this, mercy is the only love we actually have to qualify for. Because the only, the prerequisite for mercy is that you need mercy. The prerequisite for mercy is that you've failed. The prerequisite for mercy is that you've sinned. Again, the prerequisite for mercy is that you need mercy. And because of what Jesus has done, this is the great news, because of what Jesus has done, we get to choose. Because of what Jesus has done, we get what we choose. I mean, this is the choice. The choice is the consequence I deserve or the love I need. This is the choice every one of us is given. Because of what Jesus has done, I either choose the justice I deserve or the mercy I need. Remember, this is, this is intrinsic, right? This, this is intrinsic consequences. So if I choose not God, I get not God. And if I choose God, I get God. Because what Jesus has done, you can actually choose God and get God. If I choose hell, I'll get hell. But because of what Jesus has done, if you want heaven and you choose heaven, you get heaven. Because of Jesus, we get to choose. So what will he choose? Well, I choose the justice I deserve or will I choose the mercy that I need? And again, once again, this, is, this has always been the gospel. This has always been the good news. But mercy is difficult. Because why? Because in order to choose mercy, I need to trust. And what's the greatest wound in our heart? The greatest wound in our heart is distrust. Especially when the darkness is at its worst. I think that's probably the reason why Jesus appeared in 1930s to this nun, St. Faustina. Because he, he, he did, he, he said, yes, there is such a thing as divine justice. And that's a good thing. But there's also something that this world had forgotten, and that is divine mercy. That, in fact, the, Jesus said that one of the greatest wounds is that, that he experienced was that his people, people that he loved, the people that he died for, people he suffered for, they did not trust his mercy. In fact, here's the, um, so, so what happened was this. He gave uh, St. Faustina and then the church these three gifts. The first is the message, the second is the image, and the third is the chaplet. So the, the message of divine mercy is like this. Jesus said to, to, to Faustina, he said, all grace flows from mercy, and the last hour abounds with mercy for us. Let no one doubt concerning the goodness of God. Even if a person's sins were as dark as night, God's mercy is stronger than our misery. One thing alone is necessary, that the sinner set ajar the door of his heart, be it ever so little, to let in a ray of God's merciful grace, and then God will do the rest. Because that's how it happens, right? We just simply open our hearts even a little bit, and God will do the rest. He goes on to say, the greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. This is the message of divine mercy. The greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. My mercy is confirmed in every work of my hands, and he who trusts in my mercy will not perish. This is the message of divine mercy. Now, the second thing that Jesus gave through Faustina to the world is the image of divine mercy that's in front of the altar today. But, but this image that Jesus had promised, that anyone who venerates this image or honors this image, well, again, once again, this image of God's mercy, right? The, the rays of blue and of red, symbolizing baptism and symbolizing the Eucharist, coming from his heart. If you venerate this image, you'll have his mercy. But there's also this prayer called the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. So at one point, Faustina, she was given a vision. She was given a vision of God's wrath. She was given a vision, vision of divine justice. And she, she was just distraught by this. And so kind of spontaneously, she just prayed. She said, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins. And she said, at those words, the wrath of God stopped. And later on, Jesus confirmed those words, but he added at the end, not atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. In fact, how this developed is these words, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. And then on a rosary beads, you'd pray those, those ten, usually Hail Marys, you'd say the words, 
for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. And so this prayer, said, prayed on rosary beads, became the chaplet of divine mercy. And with that were some promises that Jesus again gave to St. Faustina. There's 14 promises, but here's just four, four quick promises that are associated with praying the chaplet of divine mercy. The first one is, the soul that says this chaplet will be embraced by my mercy during their lifetime and especially at the hour of their death. His second promise, when hardened sinners say it, I will fill their souls with peace and the hour of death will be a happy one. Third promise is when they say this chaplet in the presence of the dying, so it's not even them, but you're saying in the presence of someone who's dying, I will stand between my father and the dying person, not as a just judge, but as a merciful savior. And the fourth one I just want to share today is, is a priest who recommend it to sinners as their last hope of, will recommend this to sinners as their last hope of salvation. And I'm, I'm here, priest, recommending the chaplet of divine mercy as the last hope of salvation. It goes on to say, even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet only once, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy and I desire to grant unimaginable graces to those souls who trust in my mercy. Why? Pause on this. Why did Jesus want this chaplet prayed? Why? Why would this prayer be so powerful? That's, that's one of the questions that I, I ask. And I would say this, well, I'll ask another question. What is the single greatest act of mercy? In the history of the world, what is the single greatest act of love? We know it's the cross. That Jesus poured himself out to his Father out of love for humanity, to glorify his Father and to save us. And we also know that we represent, we represent that sacrifice, that once for all sacrifice. At every Mass, that's what we're participating in, right? At every Mass, we are representing that one sacrifice once for all to the Father. Because there's, not, there's nothing like the Mass, right? The Mass is the source and summit of the Christian life. The Mass is the sacrifice. What we do at the altar here, the Mass is the sacrifice of Calvary. It is the source of all grace. And so the chaplet, what the chaplet does, is the chaplet extends the greatest act of mercy out into the world. The greatest act of mercy is Calvary, right? And, and we represent Calvary at every Mass. What the chaplet does is allows us to participate in and apply what God has done to this situation, or to this person, or to this circumstance in an unparalleled way. Go look, listen to the words. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happens at every Mass. We're offering the sacrifice of the Son to the Father in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. See, this is one of the greatest gifts we can do, that when we go to the Mass, we participate. We're, we're, we're engaged in the sacrifice of Jesus to the Father that saved the world. He can't get to Mass to be able to pray the chaplet extends the graces, the mystery, the power of the Mass, the power of mercy out into the world. That's one of the reasons why Jesus would say, yes, in the presence of the dying, pray this prayer. Why? Because this extends, I'll say it again, extends and applies the graces of Calvary and the graces of the, the Mass to even those hardened sinner. Now keep this in mind. Saying this prayer, it's not, a, it's not a mantra, it's not magic, it is mercy. That this whole thing is not an incantation. Praying this prayer is the incarnation. It's the passion. It's the death. It's the resurrection of Jesus. It's, it's a relationship with him. That's one of the reasons why Jesus, when he so, said this to Faustina, he said, it's not just about the devotion, it's about what's behind the devotion. It's about living a life of trust and mercy. But living a life of trust and mercy, in fact, he said it like this. Uh, Jesus said this to, uh, to Faustina. He said, the graces of my mercy are drawn by one vessel and one vessel only, and that is trust. The more a soul trusts, the more it will receive. So we have to have this trust. In fact, we, ha we have to not only have this trust, we have to be willing to live trust. So there's a great book about consecration to divine mercy by Father Michael Gately. And I think it's called The Way of Merciful Love. And, or 33 Days of Merciful Love, Father Michael Gately, he, had, he, was, he was troubled by this. He was like, okay, how do I live trust? Like, if, if the greatest wound in our hearts is the wound of distrust, how do I live trust? And he's very perplexed by this, but he, he talked to someone, that, a mentor of his. And the mentor was, made it very simple. He said, well, the way you live trust is by praise and thanksgiving. That's it. <laughs> to praise God and thank God 
in all things, that's living trust. I mean, think about this in your life and my life. How do I know if I'm growing in trust? Well, okay, here's a situation where you have a lot of uncertainty. Here's a situation where there's some difficulty. Here's a situation where you have no idea how things are gonna turn out. But I trust you, God. Well, how? I'm gonna praise you now. I'm gonna thank you now. The way to live trust is to praise God and thank him now. I would say another way to live trust is through the sacrament of confession. We know that the sacrament of confession is a sacrament of mercy, but we know this. It's a sacrament of trust. It's we come before God at our worst and we present our hearts as, the, as they are at their worst. And we're saying, God, I even trust you even at my worst. So we realize, right, to, to, to live this, to live mercy is not, again, to pray the chaplet, to live this power of God's divine mercy, to choose mercy is not just about a mantra. It is not magic. It is mercy. It's not an incantation. It is the incarnation. It's living trust and it's also living mercy. Jesus said, I demand from you, if you're going to receive my mercy, I demand from you deeds of mercy, which are to arise out of your love for me. You are to show your mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. You must not shrink from this or try to excuse or absolve yourself from it. And I'm asking you, I'm giving you three ways of exercising mercy. First, by deed, second, by word, and third, by prayer. First, by deed, second, by word, and third, by prayer. Question, how can we live not only trust, praise and thanksgiving, going to confession, how do we live mercy? Well, we do it by giving mercy to those who need it. We, we live it by speaking mercy to those who need to hear it. And we do it by praying the chaplet of divine mercy, by prayer. And that's the invitation this week, is, is to pray the chaplet of divine mercy and to realize that if I pray the chaplet of divine mercy for myself, I'm not going to get what I deserve. And if I pray the chaplet of divine mercy for someone else, the truth is they might not get what they deserve either. This is the last thing. Rudolf Hess mentioned him at the beginning of this. As I said, he was baptized Catholic, had his first Holy Communion as a, whatever, second grader probably. Fell away from the church, became this, this person that would be unrecognizable to us, unrecognizable, maybe even to the Lord, I don't know. As I said, when he, um, when he was on the stand in his uh, trial, he seemed like he didn't care. He seemed completely unmoved by the accusations against him. He seemed completely unmoved by the evil that he had done and the lives that he had completely ruined. As I said, he tried to at one point commit suicide. He was put into prison and he did have one fear. The fear wasn't death. His fear was that when he got to prison, people would treat him like the way he treated the prisoners in Auschwitz. But something else happened. When he got into prison, people didn't just treat him well. People treated him with kindness. You think, why? Why would they treat him with kindness? The reality is because they knew mercy. And that mercy did something. That mercy broke through Rudolf Hess's life in a way that justice couldn't. The mercy broke through Rudolf Hess's heart in a way that punishment couldn't, not even execution could. And at one point, God's grace moved in his heart in such a way that he asked for a priest. You know, crazy, uh, crazy enough that they couldn't find a priest. They couldn't find a priest who was willing to come to this man's cell and hear his confession because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to confession. And he couldn't find a priest because imagine these priests, a lot of them had their brothers killed by this man. They had their families killed by this man. They had countless Catholics as well as obviously millions of Jews killed by this man. So some priests who were asked didn't go. There was one priest who was a Jesuit, one priest who did actually show up. He and Rudolf Hess had had an encounter before when he was in the commandant of Auschwitz. At one point, this Jesuit priest had broken into Auschwitz to try to serve his Jesuit brothers. And for whatever reason, it's completely unknown, it's the mystery of God's providence, that when that priest was brought before commandant Hess, Rudolf Hess said, fine, you can, you can leave. I'm not going to keep you here. I'm setting you free. That priest heard that Rudolf Hess wanted to go to confession, so that priest went to his cell. And apparently we don't know what they said, obviously, because confession is just sealed. 
but it took hours. At the end of that confession, I imagine that priest extended his hand over Rudolf Hess's head and he said, by the ministry of the church, I absolve you of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The next day, that priest came back, this time with the Eucharist, with Jesus and Holy Communion. And the reports are that Rudolf Hess knelt down and was weeping as he received the body and blood of our Lord for the first time in a lifetime and for the last time in his lifetime. And Rudolf Hess didn't get what he deserved. And that might be something that really upsets us. And in fact, that might be something that's too much for us to accept. And maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe there should be a limit to mercy. Maybe God's mercy, maybe his love, should run out at some point. Maybe that's fair. Maybe that would be fair. But the mystery of mercy is that it's scandalous. The mystery of mercy is that when we think it could run out, we're underestimating the depth of the passion of Jesus. When we think that there should be a limit to God's mercy, we think that what Jesus did on Calvary is shallower than it actually is. Then we think that there should be a limit, that then no, 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 some people should just get what they deserve. We don't realize that what Jesus did on the cross, he bore the weight of every sin, every sin that everyone could have possibly committed so that at the end of our lives and even in the midst of our lives, he bore the weight of every sin so that you and I could have a choice. And that choice will be, what do I want? Do I want the justice I deserve? Or do I want the mercy that I need. I invite you to stand as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's love for each one of us, we now approach him with our needs. That the church may be empowered by the Spirit to share the faith with all the world, and for an abundance of good and holy shepherds to lead us, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That church leaders will bear witness to the good news of the resurrection and stay true to the mission entrusted to them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That as the apostles put their resources at the service of the needy, so we may support the efforts of pregnancy resource centers that provide alternatives to abortion, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who are ill may experience the healing power of Christ through the care of those dedicated to their care. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have died may have their sins forgiven through God's grace and mercy, 
and may share fully in the promise of the resurrection, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the grace this week to pray the chaplet with trust and love, and to choose the mercy we need over the justice we deserve, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue our prayer by offering our diocese to Duluth, prayer for vocations. I invite you to pray for vocations here in our diocese as well as your home diocese. Almighty Father, we beg you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families to encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood, permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. We pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good all his holy church. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the oblations of your people and of those you have brought to new birth, that renewed by confession of your name and by baptism, they may attain unending happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but on this day, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true lamb who takes away, has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death, and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. 
We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Daniel, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
bring your hand and feel the place of the nails. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Alleluia. The Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 27. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that our reception of this Paschal Sacrament may have a continuing effect in our minds and in our hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just one quick announcement. One is, or it's not an announcement as much as it is a reminder, um, that uh, you know that this Mass is offered for all of you who are attending because you're not able to get to Mass. But the invitation, of course, remains the same as we mentioned during Mass. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, when you can't get to Mass, but also at any point, is an incredible and powerful way to extend the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ out into the world. And so, again, whenever there's an opportunity to be able to pray the chaplet is a great and powerful grace. It is an incredible way in which God invites us to participate in and apply the graces of his sacrifice into the world. And so just a reminder and an encouragement to pray the chaplet as often as you can. St. Michael, be our angel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Now, mighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A Te clamamus, Exules Filiae Ve, A Te Suspiramus, Gementes et Flentes, In Ac Lacrimarum Vale. Ea Ergo, Advocata Nostra, I los tuos misericordes oculos ad nos converte. Et Jesum, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende.